If you're a birder or a bird photographer interested in migration, and you should be, you're in for a treat. Today's guest is author, ornithologist, and naturalist, Scott Widensaw, to talk about bird migration around the world. Hello, I'm nature and wildlife photographer, Kirby Flanagan, and this is episode number 107 of the Photographing the West podcast. If you're new here, welcome. And while you're new, please hit the subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. If you're not new here, welcome back. And if you haven't subscribed, please help me out and hit that subscribe button too. It's a great pleasure to welcome back Scott Widensall to Photographing the West. You've been a busy guy as usual since the last time we got together. Lots of field work and a new book too. Thanks for taking the time to talk about bird migration again. Hi, Scott. Nice, nice to be back, Kirby. Always a pleasure to talk bird migration with you. I always enjoy it as well. So one of the big advances in the study of bird migration has been the miniaturization of tracking technology. Talk about that and what we've learned since, since uh, being able to use that technology. Sure. So, um, you know, we've been able to track some birds for a long time across long distances, you know, using satellite transmitters that communicate with the Argos weather satellites overhead, but they're pretty heavy, the transmitters are. So we were really restricted to, to tracking larger birds, like the size of a good sized duck or a small hawk or larger. But most migratory birds are a lot smaller than that. So until recently, we had no way of really tracking them across distance. I mean, you could follow one with with a handheld radio receiver and, and an antenna, but that takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of time. And once the bird starts migrating, you lose them pretty quickly. But transmitters today have gotten so small that depending on the technology you're using, you can actually put them on hummingbirds. I mean, and there are what are known as nanotag transmitters that are a fraction of a fraction of a gram. You can actually put these on migratory insects like monarch butterflies and some migratory dragonflies. And it's opened up a whole new world of understanding about where migratory birds are going, what routes they're taking, what habitats they're using, what resources they need, where the dangers lie on their migration. And it's, uh, it's, it's changed our understanding um, of bird migration in a really, a really significant way. And I, I've been particularly privileged to have been working with a number of these new, new emerging technologies, you know, these nanotag transmitters and a what's known as the MODIS wildlife tracking system, which is this automated network now with like about 1300 receiver stations around the world that are picking up the transmissions of these, of these transmitters as the birds are migrating. Um, in the last seven or eight years, um, I've been working with some colleagues to study snowy owl migration using larger GPS GSM transmitters about the size of, you know, about the size of a matchbox. They weigh about two ounces. And, you know, snowy owl is a bigger animal. It can carry a little bit heavier load. And these transmitters have, well, first of all, they communicate continuously with the GPS satellites overhead. So as frequently as every six seconds, they're logging a very precise GPS location, latitude, longitude, altitude, and flight speed of that owl. And then they dial up a couple times through the week through the cell phone network and send us the data. And so my standard joke is that my, my friends are cooler than your friends because I, I get text messages from snowy owls. Um, these transmitters also have little accelerometers in them. They have temperature sensors. So we're getting all of this fire hose of data from these birds. And it gives us, it gives us a window into the day-to-day, moment-to-moment lives of migratory birds that we've never had before. And it's coming just in the nick of time because, unfortunately, the populations of many of these migratory birds are in serious decline. And if we're going to reverse those declines and restore their populations. We're going to need to know where these birds are going and what numbers, what habitats they're using, what dangers they're facing so we can mitigate all of those things. And, and these new tracking technologies are giving us that information that we've never had before. And it allows you to uh, look at information from where they're uh, nesting and from where they're wintering and those sort of things, which we've never had before, I guess. Well, it's true, and, and you know, and, and I have I have known I have known colleagues who kind of grumble a little bit about how quote unquote easy it is. Um, one friend of mine years ago said, ah, "It's damn fat man biology. You sit at your computer and you type your keyboard, and you don't actually have to get out there and do the field work." <laughs> but the the inf- and, it, and there's a, there's some validity to that. Um, although, frankly, 
you know, when we're when we're up in the middle of the Alaskan wilderness, dodging grizzly bears and angry mama moose, trying to put geolocators on thrushes and warblers, um, it's still it's still pretty challenging field work. But the fact is, the 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 caliber of information that we get. Um, uh, it, it makes it makes it worthwhile. Um, you know, information that we simply would have no other means um, of obtaining. All right. Well, uh, one of the things that uh, interested me in reading your book was uh, talking about uh, stopover sites. So, what uh, what role do they play in bird migration? Sure. Well, I like just like you know, you, you we humans can't take a multi day road trip without figuring out where we're going to stop for the night, where we're going to get gas and where we're going to get something to eat. Well, the same thing with birds. Um, you know, when you've got birds that are traveling thousands or tens of thousands of miles a year, they have to have reliable places along the way where they can stop and rest and re refuel. Um, you know, the birds can't just continually migrate. So what most migratory birds do is they'll fly a fairly long distance and then they'll be, a, and that'll take them to a place often, you know, flying over some sort of a barrier, like an ocean or a desert, um, some inhospitable habitat. And then they'll reach the far side and there'll be a place where they can rest, where they know they're going to find food, where for uncounted generations, other migratory birds of their species have stopped there. So they get these kind of genetically coded instructions that tell them to fly in a certain direction at a certain time of the year for a certain length of time. They know at an instinctive level on the other side of this barrier, this ocean, or desert or whatever, there's going to be, there's going to be food. And, you know, the land there, they'll spend sometimes just days, sometimes weeks rebuilding their fat reserves. In some places, they may only be there for a couple of hours. It may just, they just may need a little place. Like, for example, when birds are migrating north in the springtime across the Gulf of Mexico, if they get caught in storms out over the Gulf of Mexico, what would normally be a relatively easy 18 or 20 hour flight to for them may turn into a 30 or 35 or 40 hour marathon. Well, then when they finally make landfall, they're going to, they're going to come down to the very first land they see. And it's a phenomenon called fallout where, you know, if you're a birder in those, in those coastal maritime forests, when that happens, you know, there's just suddenly there are tens of thousands of birds around you and they may only be there for a couple of hours just to regain, regain a little bit of their, of their um, energy, rest a little bit, get a little bit to eat, a little bit to drink, and then fly you know, another 100 or 150 miles inland into the bottomland swamp forests of East Texas or Louisiana or Alabama, which are kind of like a five-star hotel for birds. And so you know, their migration often is from one five-star hotel across long distances to another, but they can't make the migration without those stopover points. And unfortunately, some of the most important stopover points in the world have become increasingly threatened. Yeah, that was going to be my next question is what happens when those stopover sites are no longer available? Well, and, and we're seeing that in, in some parts of the world and, and arguably one of the most important and probably the most threatened of all the stopover sites is the Yellow Sea uh, between China and the Korean Peninsula. And this is an important stopover site primarily for migratory shorebirds, about 11 to 13 million godwits and sandpipers and plovers and stints and, and, uh, and, and avocets and all sorts of other migrant, migrant shorebirds coming from Australia, New Zealand, Oceania, Southeast Asia, funneling up through this little narrow area in the Yellow Sea and then fanning out from there basically from from Eastern Eurasia all the way to Alaska. So in, across an enormous part of the Northern, Northern Hemisphere. And they, they arrive on the Yellow Sea after in many cases having flown 6,000 miles nonstop from like the North Island of New Zealand. And the attraction on the Yellow Sea are the largest mud flats in the world. When the tide goes out at a place like Dongling, north of Shanghai, the tide goes out like 20 or 30 kilometers. It's extraordinarily expansive areas of of mud. And then they, you know, they're feeding on marine invertebrates and worms and small mollusks and other, and other things in the, in, a, in, a, in the mud. It's an incredibly rich buffet for migratory shorebirds. And these birds, you know, they've just flown 6,000 miles. They need to double their weight in a couple of weeks, and they're going to fly another five or 6,000 miles from there all the way back up into the Arctic. So it's just a way station for them. The problem is that over the, the last number of decades, um, China and particularly China, 
China and the, and the government of South Korea, to a lesser extent, North Korea, have destroyed about 60 or 70 percent of the mudflats along the Yellow Sea. They've, they've built big seawalls. They've pumped sediment in and filled them and turned them into dry land. So there's very little habitat left for these birds. And it has had a calamitous effect on their populations. Um, as one scientist told me, it is a it is now a birds per hectare equation that, you know, for every for every acre of habitat that is destroyed, birds die because there's there's simply no place left for them to go. Um, for example, a couple of years ago, the South Korean government built a 21 mile long seawall across the mouth of this 150 square mile tidal estuary on um, on the, the Yellow Sea coast a fifth of the world's population of great knots, this, this beautiful um, sort of um, uh, charcoal gray shorebird depended on that 150 square miles of tidal flat on their migrations twice a year. And when they built that seawall, a fifth of the world's great knots disappeared. They didn't go somewhere else. They just died. They had nowhere else to go. So, you know, at this point, Every time we lose a little bit more mudflat on the Yellow Sea, it's, it's disastrous for birds. The good news is that in 2018, when just a few months before I was, was over on the Yellow Sea working on this particular chapter of the book, the Chinese government made this stunning declaration. They, they out of kind of out of the blue, announced all coastal rec for, further coastal reclamation on the Ch Chinese side of the Yellow Sea was going to be banned. And they proposed the most important shorebird areas for UNESCO World Heritage Protection. Um, last year, within the, within the last year, they've nominated another 12 of the most important sites for UNESCO protection. Um, it, was a, it was a sweeping turnaround. And the conservationists that I was spending time with over there, people like Chinese conservationists like Jing Li from a small nonprofit called um, Spoonbill Sandpiper in China, and Dr. Tunis Piersma um, from the Netherlands, who's been studying studying the shorebirds there for, for decades, um, they were learning how to deal with an unfamiliar emotion, which was hope. Yeah, I uh, just recently uh, read, uh, I think it's Wendy Paulson's uh, mm -hmm. uh, post in Living Bird. Uh, she sounded a little more optimistic than you did in your book. So I don't know if things have changed since you wrote it. Or well, not. of course... Yeah, well, I mean, she's, um, and in fact, um, Wendy and, and her husband, Hank, the former U.S. Treasury Secretary, have been instrumental in nudging the Chinese government toward this decision. I think um, Hank, Hank Paulson and the Paulson Institute deserve a great deal of credit for the Chinese government's decision to ban further coastal reclamation, because the Paulson Institute, along with Chinese conservationists, had had presented what they called a blueprint for coastal conservation to the Chinese government that outlined not just the environmental reasons to protect the, the mudflats, but also the economic reasons. Millions and millions and millions of Chinese depend on the mudflats for shellfish resources. That's, where they, that's how they make their living. And those mudflats also provide coastal resiliency in the face of, of um, rising sea levels. So there were a lot of reasons why the Chinese government should have done it. It was just kind of amazing that they actually did it. And so I give, I give Wendy and Hank a lot of credit and their staff um, in, at, the, at the Paulson Institute a lot of credit for that, that outcome. Has anything similar happened in uh, the South Korean portion of the Yellow Sea? <laughs> Well, you know, the, South Korea is a democracy, so it's a lot messier there. It's not like a totalitarian, right. totalitarian government can just make a decision and everybody has to snap too. So, um, so progress has been has been slower on the on the Korean side of the peninsula, but there's a lot of Korean, uh, South Korean conservationists that are working very hard to protect the Yellow Sea. Um, people like Vivian Fu um, and uh, doing doing their doing their best to. Ensure that um, you know that we've we've lost as much as we're going to lose, and maybe we can start restoring some of what's been damaged. Yeah, sounds great. So the other interesting thing for me was uh, reading about choke points, which you mentioned in your first book, and talked again about it uh, in your second book. So what are they, and what's their importance to bird migration? Well, I mean, a lot of in in a lot of ways, choke points and stopover sites are are kind of 
the same. It's, the choke points are just kind of gigantic stopover points. They're funnel points where lots and lots of migratory birds, usually because of geography, are funneled through. The Yellow Sea is a good example because the birds come there because they have to feed. Um, Gibraltar, which you know at the at the western side of the Mediterranean between Africa and Europe, is a is a world renowned choke point because. Uh, as particularly migratory raptors like hawks and falcons and and vultures don't like to cross large areas of open water so they'll you know they'll they'll funnel down through that that lower part of the Iberian peninsula and cross the narrowest part of the Mediterranean and spread out into Africa many parts of the middle east especially down through lebanon and and, and israel um, are a major migratory choke point for birds going north and south out of um, uh, out of western eurasia and into africa and the middle east in the western hemisphere one of the biggest migration choke points in the world is um, in in eastern veracruz in eastern mexico and the coastal plain between uh, the mountains and the and the uh, the gulf of mexico Back in the early 1990s, I was part of the first team that documented the raptor migration in, in Veracruz, which turns out to be the largest raptor migration on Earth. About four and a half million hawks, eagles, falcons, vultures, kites passing down through this like 30 kilometer wide um, coastal plain in Veracruz every year, taking advantage of the powerful thermal air currents that provide uplift for the birds. I mean, it's not unusual to see half a million to a million migrant raptors in a single day in Veracruz. So, but there again, it's geography. They don't want to fly out over the ocean. They don't want to fly through the mountains because the winds are very chaotic in the mountains. So they funnel down through this, this narrow coastal plain on their way, on their way south. So uh, another interesting thing I learned about from both your books, I guess, is uh, the physiologic changes that uh, long distance migrate, yeah. migrants undergo and tell about, talk about that. Sure. I mean, it's, it actually, some of this stuff sounds like science fiction. Yeah. Um, and in fact, you know, some of, some of what birds are doing in their bodies really do speak to science fiction, things like quantum entanglement that are going to, you know, theoretically allow us to develop faster than light communication. But physiologically, during the course of the year, a migratory bird's body undergoes really rapid, dramatic changes. Um, you know, in some in some species of birds, like many of our thrushes, their digestive organs actually grow during the migration season. For example, their intestines will get longer because they need to squeeze as much caloric nutrition out of the fruits that they're eating. In other migratory birds, the opposite happens. Um, bar-tailed godwits, which have the longest migration of any land bird on earth, they, 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 they fly nonstop 7,200 miles from Alaska to the, to the Northern Island of, of New Zealand and the coast of Australia. It's a trip that'll take them anywhere from seven to 11 days of continuous powered nonstop wing beating flight. So in order to do that, when they're still in Alaska before they migrate in, in late August, early September, um, they, balloon up in weight. It's a, a phenomenon called hyperphagia where they just eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and more than double their weight. And after they've gained as much weight as they possibly can, they no longer need their digestive organs. So rather than their intestines getting longer, their stomach and their intestines and their kidneys shrink dramatically. They atrophy in just a matter of a couple of days. At the same time, their chest muscles, which are going to power their flight, grow, you know, half again as large as they are, they increase by 50%, and their heart muscle increases 30 to 50% in mass. And they do this without exercise. You know, we can add muscle mass, but it's, it's a laborious process. You know, exercise is what builds muscle mass in, 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 in mammals. Birds can do it apparently with the flip of a biochemical switch. And trust me when I say that there are human physiologists who would very much like to learn how they do this yeah. and, uh, and, and, and replicate it in people. Um, you know, birds are also able to, um, you know, I think about, a, think about a bar-tailed godwit flying for 11 days. I would get, I would get very sleepy after the first 24 or 36 hours, but this bird has to stay awake and flying for 11 days. Um, they do that because they put half of their brain to sleep at a time. It's called unihemispheric sleep. And, um, it appears most migratory birds do this, um, that they'll put one half of their brain to sleep along with a corresponding eye for a couple of seconds at a time, 10, 12 seconds, and then switch over to the other side and switch back and forth and back and forth and just do that continuously, giving their brain a rest. 
Um, and they can and they can do this in some cases for months because we have we found within the last ten years that some species of swifts that breed in in Europe, like alpine swifts and common swifts, which winter in Africa, do not stop flying once they leave the breeding grounds. Common swifts, when they leave Sweden, do not stop flying for the next ten months. Their whole flight down to Africa, the entire winter season while they're in Africa, and their all their flight all the way back up to Sweden, they never set foot on the ground. So they are sleeping on the wing, they are eating on the wing, um, spending ten months in continuous powered flight, and so they're they're constantly putting half their wing to sleep. Now, interestingly, some mammals can do this. Marine mammals like dolphins and manatees, which have to they have to breathe consciously so if they went completely to sleep they, they drown they do a, a, a unihemispheric sleep as well and and although it's not exactly the same thing humans do something similar if you've ever had an uncomfortable bad night's sleep the first night that you were sleeping in a hotel room or some other unfamiliar place that's called first night syndrome and it's because half of your brain was not going completely to sleep. It's a little evolutionary holdover from back in the days when, you know, you're, you're in a new place. There might be, you know, cave lions or hyenas or something out there that are going to get you. So you don't go completely entirely to sleep. So we, we have that in, in, uh, in similarity with migratory birds. Doesn't work, seem to work as well for us as it does for the birds. So <laughs> no, no, we're not as good at it. So, um, one of the terms that's uh, in your new book uh, kind of threw me, uh, it's called phenotypic plasticity. Can you explain that a little bit so I, I can understand it? Well, I'll do my best. Um, I'm not an evolutionary biologist. So when we think about when we think about species changing and organisms changing over time, usually what we think about is evolutionary change where where changes are are encoded in the genes and they're passed on to the next generation and generation and generations after that. But within any population of animals, there's also what biologists call phenotypic plasticity, where the, the organism can react in many different ways to changing conditions in the environment. And they can manifest those changes in their, in their, in their physical bodies. And it's, it can actually be difficult to tell the difference between phenotypic plasticity, where within that generation, the, you know, the, the organism has changed in response to the environment, and evolutionary change that's going to be passed down generation to generation. And there's a lot of there's a lot of focus on this right now. And the reason I discuss it in the book is because we're seeing changes in in the physical structure and the physical size in the physical shape of migratory birds in response to climate change. As the climate is getting warmer, as wind patterns are changing, um, what, we're, what scientists are arguing about, and they're really not sure themselves, is this phenotypic plasticity, which means it's kind of a once and done thing. The organism is changing, and it's, it's changing in response to the environment, but at some point, it's, it can only stretch so far. Or is this actually evolutionary change where these, these, these incremental changes are being passed down to the next generation and they'll be amplified and magnified and carried on, in which case the birds are more likely to adapt to the changing conditions that, that, that climate change are bringing. Most of the changes that we're seeing, for example, um, uh, a friend of mine, a, a, a shorebird scientist named Tunis Piersma from the Netherlands, has been studying a species of shorebird. We have them here in North America, but they're in Europe as well, called the red knot. And the red knots that Tunis was studying, it's actually a subspecies that's named for him, that breeds in parts of Siberia um, and, winters in, um, and winters in Africa. These birds, as the climate has gotten warmer, these red knots have gotten smaller and smaller. And particularly in really warm years in the Arctic, the red knots that are produced those years are significantly smaller than red knots have been traditionally in the past or red knots that are, that are born in, in cooler years. Um, smaller birds are more energy efficient, so it may be an adaptation to help them um, adjust to a warming climate, but it's a problem for the birds because they're smaller in wing length, they're smaller in body size, and they're smaller in bill length. And when they get down to their wintering grounds in Africa, 
they can't probe quite as deeply into the into the shore sediments where the richest food lies. And so they have a, a much greater tendency to starve to death. So is that phenotypic plasticity where they're um, adjusting within a generation to their perhaps not being as, uh, as many food resources in a warming Arctic? Or is that actually evolutionary change? We, we don't really know at this point. But we do know that if you look at... Um, uh, if you if you look at North American birds over just the last 40 or 50 years, that our migratory birds are getting smaller. Um, some scientists at the um, uh, at the at the Field Museum of Chicago did a, a really laborious, painstaking study where they meticulously measured something like 70,000 birds that had been collected over the last half century or so from flying into windows in Chicago and found with, within almost all of the species they studied over that course of time, these birds had gotten smaller. Their weight had gotten less. Their overall body sizes had gotten smaller, except for their wings. Their wings had actually gotten longer because um, the, 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 the assumption here is that in a warming climate, climate where there are fewer resources, the birds have to make do, they have to do more with what they've got. And one way of increasing their efficiency in long distance flight is by evolving longer wings. If they're actually evolving, maybe this is phenotypic plasticity. Maybe they will get stretched to a, to a certain point beyond which they can go no farther. So I'm not sure that that has has, has, has eased your confusion about phenotypic plasticity versus evolutionary change. But that's, it, as I said, it's, a, it's an area that, um, that ornithologists are spending a lot of time looking at right now because it may map out the, the difference between you know, change in survival or um, bigger problems for migratory birds down the road. Yeah, yeah it's an interesting topic. I, I've read in other places that uh, some people feel that uh, at least that... Uh, evolution can occur in a much shorter period of time than we yeah. typically thought of. Yeah. Well, that's, that's certainly been one of the big discoveries the last 30 or 40 years that what we used, what we used to think would take millennia or hundreds of millennia um, can happen very, very rapidly. It turns out that migration can occur um, at a much, at a much faster pace, which uh, frankly gives me, gives me hope because Birds are dealing, migratory birds in particular, are dealing with so many rapid fire changes. You know, the, you know people, people often say, well, you know, the climate's changed off and on repeatedly and more dramatically in the course of geologic time than it is now, which is true. But it's the pace of change today that is really unprecedented. And birds are, migratory birds are dealing with those, with that unprecedented rate of climate, of climate change at a time when their habitats you're disappearing, you know, the habitat that remains has been degraded in many ways. We've added all manner of additional dangers and threats and hazards that migratory birds have to overcome. It's not just, you know, storms and wind and exhaustion and predators. Now they have to deal with lighted skyscrapers and communication towers and cats and speeding cars and ag chemicals and, and all this, all, all the habitat loss. So it's all of those things together, just putting so much pressure on migratory birds. You know, I guess it's really not surprising that we've lost almost 3 billion birds in North America since 1970, as, as a team of top ornithologists calculated just a couple of years ago. We've lost about a third of North America's avifauna. Sometimes I look at that number and I think the amazing thing isn't what we've lost, but what we've been able to keep. The fact that two thirds of North America's birds are still hanging in there after half a century of, of so many challenges for them. How did they come up with that number? Do you have any idea? Yeah, it was, um, and it's a, it's a pretty solid number too. They didn't just pull that one out of a pull that one out of a hat. Um, you know, they used they used um, a, a huge number of long term data sets, like the Christmas bird count from Audubon that's been going on for more than a century, the breeding bird survey that's been that's been taking place at tens of thousands of locations across North America every year since nineteen. 1966, shorebird surveys, waterfowl surveys, um, you know, dozens and dozens of long-term data sets, hawk migration statistics. They also used, um, and this is one of the most important in terms of giving us actual countable numbers of numbers of migratory birds in the night sky, um, Doppler weather radar data. Um, when the National Weather Service rolled out the Doppler weather system in the 1980s, they did not do it for the sake of ornithology, but it's been one of the most significant advances in ornithological science in the last century because Doppler radar, especially the newer 
dual polarization radar they started using a few years ago um, can actually allow us to calculate how many birds per cubic meter of airspace are migrating in the night sky. Most birds migrate after dark and you can't count them because you can't see them. But with radar, you can. And so, you know, we know um, almost to the decimal point how many birds, for example, come across the Gulf of Mexico every spring and, and hit the, the northern shore of the Gulf of Mexico. It's about, you know, it's about 2.3 billion birds. And, you know, the folks at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and their colleagues working with radar data, so you know, have these, and they have these really good, firm, solid numbers. And now that we have in just mind-bogglingly powerful computers that can crunch enormous data sets, we have all of the, the archived weather radar data going back to the early 1980s. So it's essentially a time machine for us. We can crunch all of those numbers and see on a, on a week-to-week, night-to-night, month-to-month, year-to-year, decade-by-decade basis, how bird populations have changed in North America um, over the last number of decades. And yeah, at the end of the, you, when you finish running all those numbers and doing all these calculations, it was just, just under 3 billion birds that we've lost. As I said, that's not, they didn't pull that out of their butts. That's a good, solid number. Okay. I always get suspicious of round numbers, so it's good to know <laughs> there's a, a basis for it. Well, and if you if you read the paper, you know they give you an error bar. You know they say from you know a, a range right. from this to this, and ninety five percent confidence right. or an interval here, and they they lay the statistics out pretty well. Yeah, okay. So I've learned that uh, bird migration is much more complex than I would have ever imagined as a boy growing up in Iowa and watching ducks and geese fly south for the winter. How do you think these complex patterns evolve? Some of them seem pretty counterintuitive, I would say. Yeah, some of them some of them seem pretty strange based on today's world, but you've got to remember some of them started an awfully long time ago. One of the things to remember about migratory birds, most, most of our birds, like just taking the Western Hemisphere as an example, most of our migratory birds are, the most highly migratory birds are those that depend on seasonally abundant food resources like insects or fruit or nectar. Um, not that there aren't insects in the forests of northern North America in the wintertime. You've got chickadees and titmice and kinglets and things like that that spend the whole year up there, but there aren't enough insects for the hundreds of millions to billions of, of insect eating birds that migrate into the Northern hemisphere every year. We think of these as Northern birds that take a little bit of a winter vacation, right? right. But almost all of those groups of birds Orioles, tanagers, hummingbirds, uh, thrushes, tyrant flycatchers. Um, you know, those are primarily tropical families of birds. They are most abundant and most diverse in the tropics. And what we think happened here is that during these relatively brief interglacial periods, like we're in right now, when we don't have a mile thick sheet of ice sitting on top of, of North America, as the ice sheets retreat and move farther and farther north, the birds start moving farther and farther and farther and farther north every summer and then go back where they came from. So in a sense, their migration is very much retracing a path of colonization that their ancestors took um, you know, thousands of years ago and probably many, many times over the last two and a half million years as we've gone through one ice age and interglacial cycle after another. There've been like 20 expansions and contractions of glacial ice in the last two and a half million years. When the, when the ice expands and the glaciers march on the landscape, many of these birds are pushed farther south into refugia. And then as the ice retreats, they move farther and farther and farther back. And we can actually see this happening with some species today, like um, pectoral sandpipers, for example, which breed all across northern North America, across the Arctic and subarctic. Some of them have actually flown across the Bering Strait and have colonized across um, parts of eastern Eurasia. And every year they go a little farther and a little farther west across Eurasia. And in the fall, instead of going due south into like Southeast Asia, uh, which would be a terrific place for pectoral sandpiper to spend winter, instead they come back across Eurasia, back across the Bering Strait, down through Alaska and, and Canada, all the way down into South America, because that's where they came from. So we can actually mm -hmm. see some of these routes continuing to expand and continuing to colonize today. Okay. Well, that uh, kind of answers one of my other questions is uh, obviously, with these uh, small transmitters, we've gained a lot of knowledge about bird, mig bird migration. Um, 
So I guess uh, the answer to the question is that that we do now understand uh, bird migration better than we did before. And it's not just a lot of data points. Right, sure. I mean, of course, there's still a huge amount that we don't know. I mean, we know very little about almost all migratory birds. Um, you know, there's 850 species of birds that breed in North America. About 500 of those are migratory. And I'd say ballpark guess maybe fewer than 100 have been studied in any depth at all, um, using, particularly using this new, this new technology. Um, you know, that's, that's the, the part of the migration science that I get most excited about because it's one of the things that I'm most involved in. I've been, I've been really lucky to be involved in a, a number of projects that use these, um, that use these tracking technologies. You know, you know, I mentioned, you know, these little nanotags that you can put on tiny little birds and GPS satellites, um, or GPS trans transmitters. I've been involved for the last mm, seven years or so with a project in Denali National Park and in Alaska, working with the National Park Service, where we've been putting tiny little um, data loggers, which are um, something called light-sensitive geolocators, on thrushes and warblers and and sparrows, where they're not transmitters; they don't send us any data. They just they just constantly record data and store it in their memory banks. So you catch the bird in Alaska, you put this this little um, backpack. It actually fits around the top of the bird's leg, so it sits kind of low in the middle of the back. Let the bird go. It flies to its wintering grounds in Central or South America or wherever it's going, comes back the next year, and you have to find and recatch that bird, which is a challenge, and, and then take, the, take the, to the data logger off and download the data and find where that bird's, where that bird's been. And it's, it is an awe-inspiring and humbling experience to watch the data kind of spool out on your computer screen and, you know, across a Google earth map of the globe. And you see this bird that you tagged in, you know, Primrose Swale and Denali National Park, a uh, gray cheeked thrush that flew, you know, Southeast across Canada, down through the, the, the upper great lakes, um, across the Gulf of Mexico, down to the Yucatan Peninsula, down through the Isthmus of Panama into Northern South America. And ended up spending the winter in the middle of a national park in southern Venezuela in one of the most remote and pristine rainforests on Earth. Or a Swainson's thrush that, you know, did much the same thing but continued for another 4,000 miles south and spent the winter on the, on the border of Bolivia and Argentina. And, and to see the degree of, content, of connectivity between this tiny little regional breeding population in Alaska and a tiny little regional wintering population in South America. We've had thrushes that we tagged in Alaska that were less than a mile apart where they nested in Alaska. They flew almost 9,000 miles to Argentina and spent the winter less than 20 kilometers apart down there. So what happens in those little areas in a distant part of the world is going to have a profound impact on the safety and security of the populations of birds breeding in our national parks in even the most remote and protected areas in Alaska. So understanding how these different parts of the annual cycle, different parts of the migration route all connect together are going to be critical for protecting these birds long term. Yeah, for sure. Why, why did you think, well, you, you partly explained it, I guess, that uh, most of these are neotropical birds that uh, go for a summer vacation up, up in our part of the world. And, uh, but uh, it seems counterintuitive to me, the, at least, that uh, they would do this long distance flying uh, uh, from one part of the world to another. Sure, why not just stay in the tropics? Yeah, or, you know, <laughs> fly back and forth between uh, Mexico and Minnesota, who knows? Uh, well, there, I mean, and there are, are, of course, there are birds that fly back and forth between Mexico and Minnesota, and there's some that go from Minnesota all the way down into the Amazon. Um, one of the reasons, well, there's, I think there's a couple of reasons here. Um, one is that nature abhors a vacuum, and the northern hemisphere in the summertime is a great place to raise a family if you're a small insect-eating bird. The sun shines, you know, almost all the time or north of the Arctic Circle all the time in the summer. So you get a 24-hour day sunlight. 
if you're an insect eating bird, God knows the forests and tundra of the North are full of insects. Anybody who's been there in black fly or mosquito season knows that. Yep. Um, and that's protein. That's, that's bird food. Um, mm. And so something is going to take advantage of that because, because nature abhors a vacuum. Something is going, to, is going to occupy that land. And if in order to do that, they have to fly long distances back and forth, well, that's the price they pay. But here's the interesting thing. Living in the tropics is no, is no, is no bowl of cherries. Um, in fact, tropical resident birds, non-migratory tropical resident birds, have a really hard time successfully raising their chicks because there's so many other dangers and so many other um, risks. Their, their nest, I mean, first of all, we have no monkeys in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, um, there are very few, you know, you're not going to find a lot of snakes in Alberta or Alaska, yeah. um, you know, tropical diseases, tropical parasites, tropical threats. It takes um, tropical resident birds have to live a very long time in order to eventually replace themselves with two chicks that successfully make it to adulthood. Um, because they lose nest after nest after nest after nest. They have to keep trying again and again and again and again. Whereas migratory songbirds are at greater risk and they live shorter lives, but their, reprodu their annual reproductive success is much higher. So they don't have to breed as frequently um, in order to replace themselves you know, over, the, over the long term. So at the end of the day, it's, it's kind of a wash between the two. If you're a tropical bird, yeah, you don't you don't suffer many, nearly as many risks to you as a migratory bird does, but it's gonna you're gonna have to live much longer to replace yourself. Whereas a migratory songbirds live a shorter, tougher life, but they have a higher reproductive potential. Oh, so, kind of okay. all works out. Interesting. Well, uh, we could talk for hours about this, I guess. <laughs> but uh, before we uh, wrap it up. Uh, Let's talk about where people can find you and where they can buy your book and uh, learn sure. about all the things you're doing these days. Certainly. Well, you can, you can find me at www.scottweidensall, S-C-O-T-T-W-E-I-D-E-N-S-A-U-L.com. Um, I am not on social media. I am, I am an old Luddite in that sense. Um, and as far as the book, the book is called A World on the Wing, and it's published in the U.S. by W.W. W. Norton. And um, uh, if you want to if you want to get the book and support local independent bookstores, but you still like ordering online, you can go to bookshop.org. That's bookshop, one word, dot org. That's a consortium of about 1,700 independent book dealers around the country. You can pick the, the book dealer closest to you or one somewhere else, and you can order the book and get it shipped to you online. That's um, been really handy during the pandemic, obviously. Um, so yeah, that was, that's, that'd, be, that'd be the easiest way to, uh, to get the book. So. Okay. All right. Yeah. So what's next for Scott? Not once you get through, uh, well, hitting the tour route. <laughs> Yeah, I'm actually hitting the road shortly for the first time in 14 months. I've been I've spent the last uh, little bit more than a year at our our house in New Hampshire, which has been very very nice uh, um, because the migratory birds bring the world to me anyway. But yeah, it's um, going to be heading back on the road for um, some book stuff and getting back up into Alaska to uh, to one of our research sites, getting back up to Denali National Park and. Um, taking leading a, a tour group to the Galapagos later this summer, something that uh, was supposed to do two years ago that, that got postponed. So yeah, so lots of, lots of good stuff coming. Yeah, good. Sounds like a lot of work and a lot of fun. Yeah, definitely. Well, thanks for being on Photographing the West again, Scott. I've been looking forward to this discussion ever since I learned that you had a book, new book coming out. Well, it's, 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 a, it's a pleasure. The name of the book is, as he's mentioned, A World on the Wing, The Global Odyssey of Migratory Birds. And it's a great read, I can say, it's since I finished it in its entirety. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Photographing the West. We publish on the 15th and 30th of each month. Please take a moment to subscribe. We'll be back on May 30th with an episode on Aurora Photography with Dan mm -hmm. Carr. Bye till then.